So I totally wasn't paying attention to where I was timing wise on the last video and I got cut off. Um, so I left it off here talking about volcanoes being formed at convergent plate boundaries. And this is a bathymetry image of an underwater volcano called Brothers Volcano off the coast of New Zealand. And in 2018, I was on a research expedition to Brothers Volcano um, and it is an active underwater volcano and we were drilling into the volcano and looking at the rocks um, in the volcano to identify different types of minerals that were found and the different hydro uh, hydrothermal fluids that were found inside the rocks. And so just showing you proof that you do have underwater volcanoes forming near convergent plate boundaries. We are at a trench called the Kermadec Trench, um, which you can easily find on a map. So if you want more information about drilling into an underwater volcano, ask me. Um, and this is just a picture here showing you what subduction looks like. Again, oceanic crust being more dense plunges back into the mantle and it melts and that melting rock become is less dense because it's hot and so it rises up and that's where your your volcanoes form all right so one other thing with reference to convergent plate boundaries you may have heard of the ring of fire before that is the area in the pacific ocean where you've got a lot of both um, volcanic activity and earthquake activity um, hence the ring of fire referring to the volcanoes and so that's where all of your major trenches are. So there's a lot of subduction zones in the Pacific Ocean. The Marianas Trench over here is the deepest trench in the world. The deepest point of the Marianas Trench is about 6.98 miles down. So really, really deep. Um, the blue stars indicate big earthquakes within the past 50 years, like the big one that happened in Indonesia that triggered the big tsunami back in... 05, I think it was, originated over at this blue star in the Java Trench. The Brothers Volcano, where I was just talking about, we were drilling over here in the Kermadec Trench. Up in the Aleutians, you get a lot of major earthquakes um, and potential tsunamis, and we'll talk about tsunamis later. So the Ring of Fire is associated with convergent plate boundaries because you've got so many volcanoes happening. My third and final type of plate boundary is that of a transform plate boundary. So at divergent boundaries, crust is being created. At convergent boundaries, crust is being destroyed. But at a transform boundary, none of that is happening to the crust. There's no creation or destruction. The plate movement at a transform boundary is that the plates just kind of slide horizontally past each other. So there's no crustal creation or destruction. Um, which is exactly what it says there on the slide. You are familiar with a transform boundary. The most famous one, at least here in the United States, is that of the San Andreas Fault in California. Um, so that's a picture showing the horizontal movement of two plates at a transform boundary. This is what the um, boundary actually looks like. So here's the fault line, that middle point. So you can imagine uh, the left side, we'll say, is the one that's moving forward, and this right side is moving backwards, and so they're just kind of sliding past each other. But it's not just like easy gliding past each other. They get caught up, you know, the sides of the plates get caught up on each other. And what happens as any of these plates are moving, they're building up tension because they're getting stuck on each other. And eventually, that tension gives and the plates shift suddenly. And that's what an earthquake is. So an earthquake is just a sudden movement of the plates. And then during the time between earthquakes, tension is building up again. And eventually that tension gives, the plates shift suddenly, and that's what your big earthquake is. Um, so earthquakes happen at all three types of plate boundaries because an earthquake happens when the plates move. Well, obviously the plates are moving at all three types of boundaries. Um, crust is being created at divergent, or I'm sorry, yeah, divergent boundaries. Crust is being destroyed at convergent boundaries. You can find volcanoes at both convergent and divergent boundaries. 
um, at a divergent boundary again, where the plates are moving away from each other, magma rises up and kind of, if it builds up in a mountain form, that is a volcanic mountain. You also get volcanics, uh, volcanoes at convergent boundaries due to the oceanic crust melting back in the mantle, and that melted magma rises up to the surface and forms volcanoes that way. But no volcanoes associated with transform boundaries. And so again, another map, but showing the same thing of the major plates. And if you think about where you hear about earthquakes, it's always going to be around, almost always going to be around plate boundaries, almost always. Um, there are some places like in the middle of a plate um, where you might have a little bit of a weakness and the plate might shift a little bit and you can get an earthquake. But more often than not, earthquakes are happening around the boundaries of the plates as the plates are shifting suddenly. All right, so let's talk about moving away from plates and things like that, building up and wearing things down. So you've got internal and external geologic processes. Internal processes, you know, convection, things we've already talked about. Um, the convection cells, the magma moving the plates builds up our surface features. As the plates move around and like two continental crusts bump into each other, that can form a mountain. Um, Internal processes can move the plates around and form, have a subduction zone, and you can have underwater volcanoes being formed. So that's what we're talking internal processes. External processes are things like weathering and erosion, which people tend to use interchangeably, but they are not the same terms. Weathering can be broken down into three types, physical, chemical, and biological. And what weathering is, is the breaking down of surface features, the breaking down of rocks into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And that's what people often refer to as erosion, but that's not correct. So weathering is where we're taking like a big boulder and over a lot of time that boulder is broken up into smaller rocks, the smaller rocks are broken up into tiny pebbles, and the tiny pebbles can eventually be broken up into tiny pieces of soil. So weathering is breaking things down. I'll show you pictures and give you examples of weathering shortly. Erosion, what do you think? Is erosion building things up or wearing things down? Well, you might not know because you were like, well, I thought erosion was weathering and now I'm really confused. The definition of erosion is just moving something from one place to another. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, moving rocks, usually, or soil from one place to another. It has nothing to do with breaking it down. It's just simply transporting it from one place to another place. And things that can cause erosion, the wind, obviously, movement of water, humans, clearly, and glacial movement can erode rocks. So here's some pictures to give you examples of weathering and erosion. Uh, this is at a glacier up in Seward, Alaska called Exit Glacier, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and all of this rock all through here has been pushed by the glacier. When glaciers move, they act like a bulldozer, pushing all the rock in front of them. And so all of this was pushed by the glacier. So that is an example of erosion. But the glacier also, due to all the pressure of the ice and the flowing water that's underneath the glacier, that broke down the large pieces of bedrock. So, you know, if you start with a big boulder like this one in the middle, all that pressure and movement of water is going to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces, which is weathering. So glaciers can both weather and erode bedrock. Eroding it, meaning moving it, and then weathering it breaking it down. Another picture here, this big dirt pile that you see going up the middle of this glacier is just another example of how glaciers transport rocks and sediment and soil. So this is called a moraine and it shows you how far, you know, the furthest extent that the glacier pushed to. Um, and it deposited all of that stuff there. And again, that's an example of erosion. So going back to weathering, 
you've got three types, whoops, three types of weathering, biological, chemical, and physical. Biological, lichens, mosses, tree roots, kind of breaking things down. Chemical, like acid rain, um, and physical weathering, just like you see here, wind, rain, freezing. Uh, potholes, which we don't have tons of here in Florida, but if you were to go to somewhere that it's where there's a real winter, where it freezes in the winter, you get these potholes forming and then rainwater fills them up and then it freezes and water expands when it freezes and it cracks the asphalt even more, um, making even larger and larger potholes. That's an example of physical weathering. An example of biological weathering, these are some lichens growing on a rock at Denali National Park. Now you can't see the lichens, you know, breaking down the rock, but they are secreting an enzyme that's slowly dissolving the rock into smaller and smaller pieces. I don't have any pictures of chemical weathering, and that's okay. All right, so I'm going to cut it off here because I'm almost at my 15 minute time limit, um, and I will hopefully get finished in the next video talking about volcanoes and tsunamis. So that's it for now. If you have any questions, please let me know.